Welcome to Voices of Esalen. I'm Sam Stern. My guest today is Dr. Richard Schwartz. In an interview we recorded at Esalen in February of 2020, Dr. Schwartz is a psychologist and the creator of Internal Family Systems, which focuses on the various parts that exist within a person. This is probably the most personal episode that I've ever recorded because in an effort to help Dr. Schwartz explain his model, I ended up getting roped into doing some work with him and got kind of vulnerable. And yet, I have to admit, I really benefited greatly from the session. More importantly, I think that if you make it through this episode, you will have a clear understanding of how internal family systems therapy works, what it can do, how it can help clients experience a deep and integrative experience of the self. Richard Schwartz, thanks so much for joining us today on Voices of Esalen. Glad to be here, sir. Would you start off, would you mind giving us an introduction to the IFS model? You know, I'll compress what I usually take two hours to do into five minutes. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's, it, it, it's it, okay. It's a task, but I, I thought it might be useful. I'll try my best. So the first assumption is that we're all multiple personalities, not in the sense that we have that disorder, but that we all have, I call parts, full range inner personalities. And that it's the natural state of the mind to be multiple that way, that we all have these parts, they're all valuable, there aren't any bad ones. But as we go through life, they're forced out of their naturally valuable states into roles that can be damaging and they don't like to protect us or or some of them we lock away because they carry emotions and thoughts and beliefs from the traumas that we want to forget about and move away from. Do our parts function one at a time or do they work in conjunction with one another? It really varies because depending on how polarized your system is, sometimes one will totally take over uh -huh. and lock all the others out. And sometimes in a harmonious family without a lot, inner family without a lot of trauma, then uh, yeah, they kind of take turns and they work around and they're collaborating and you hardly notice them because they are in harmony. It's like um, if we looked out at a flock of birds and they were all moving together. That's the goal, is to help them return to that harmonious state. But most of us, because of our lives, uh, they got into very extreme roles, and then others polarized with that one, and so it's kind of a mess in there for most of us. Is the idea when, when we're born, we are uh, just a singular self, or are we born with, with a set of harmonious parts? Yeah, my, my belief is that we're born with uh, some of them online. So like infant researchers like T. Barry Brazelton will talk about five different states that infants rotate through. So maybe that's the parts that are online when you're born, and the rest are dormant. Okay. And I, I met your daughter. There will come a time, like when she's about two, where she, you'll put to, to bed this compliant little girl, and overnight she'll wake up and she'll be saying no to everything. <laughs> well, it's like that assertive part just comes in overnight, okay. out of dormancy. And if you're raised in a harmonious environment, they'll come in on time in a very helpful way. And like I said, they're all valuable. So so if you're raised in an inharmonious environment, the idea is that one or two parts could become, could, it could have a larger sort of role in shaping how your your, your personality functions? Yeah, and uh, parts take on what I call burdens, which the uh, definition of which is a belief or emotion that came into you from some bad experience and then attach to these parts, almost like a virus and drive the way they operate. Someone who's had a lot of trauma or attachment injury will have lots of burden parts, and they're very extreme because they still carry these emotional remnants, and also because when you get traumatized, parts for some reason become frozen in time. So they live as if you're still five years old and you're, you know, your father is beating you. I'm not saying that's true for you, but... And so they think they have to be extremely protective because danger is everywhere. Mm. And a lot of the work is actually going back and getting them out of where they're stuck, bringing them into the present or to a nice fantasy place, and then helping them unload these extreme beliefs and emotions, at which point they'll immediately transform into their naturally valuable states. Let's talk about the general groups of parts. You, you use a, a framework of exiles, managers, and firefighters. Yeah, so as I was uh, exploring all this, because what I'm teaching you didn't come out of my head. I'm a phenomenologist, I, you know, I, an empiricist, come from this very scientific background. 
And my clients started talking this language, which was totally foreign to me. They, you know, would talk about these parts. I'm a family therapist by training, so I got intrigued by this internal system. Mm. They were all had relationships with each other. And so as I got more interested in it, I was making mistakes because I was, they would always talk about these parts that were hurting. And I would try to get to those parts very quickly because I felt like that's what we had to heal. And then they have these big backlash reactions afterwards. And after some of that, I said, I've got to, this is a delicate ecology I'm mucking around with. I've got to learn the rules. Yeah. So I asked clients, what am I doing wrong? And they taught me this map. And so the main distinction is between vulnerable parts of you, Sam, that are most sensitive parts, but inner children like parts that before they get hurt, are delightful to be with. And they give us all the creativity and awe at the world and desire to connect with people and all that. But once they get hurt, once they get burdened with these emotions like emotional pain or shame or terror from traumas, then we don't want anything to do with them anymore. And we kind of put them in an inner basement or a cave or, or a cyst something to just keep them from infecting us, keep them from overwhelming us and pulling us back into those scenes. Because it's too painful to it's too painful, with them. or you know, and also everybody around you told you to get over it, just move on, don't look back. So ours is a get over it, move on, rugged individualist culture. Yeah. So most all of us did that with uh, the pain or the especially men. But not just. So most all of us have a bunch of these exiles locked up someplace. And when you get a bunch of exiles, you feel a lot more delicate. Things can trigger you a lot more easily. Mm. And the world seems a lot more dangerous. Because if the exile gets triggered by some kind of similar thing that might happen, it is like this: these flames of emotion consume you and bring you back into the scene and re-traumatize and all those dreadful things that everybody's afraid of. And so then you have to have a bunch of all these other parts who are in unburdened, nice roles now have to f jump into protective roles. These are your managers? These managers and firefighters both. And some of them are trying to manage your life, manage the external world, so you don't get triggered. So they manage your relationships so nobody gets too close or people you depend on don't get too distant or manage your appearance so you don't get rejected, manage your performance so you do well and get accolades. These, yeah, we call the managers, and they're the ones that are running your life day to day. Uh, in the spirituality world, they're known derogatorily as the ego. Mm, okay. They're just little kids, too, by and large, just trying to keep you safe. And they're over-promoted. In family therapy, we, we call that parentified children. They're forced into a parental role, parentified inner children. And they, because they're over-promoted... They get rigid and they start yelling at you. And now, when you say overpromoted, that means that the outside world fixates on them, or they? No, it means in the inner world, they have to take on a leadership role, and they're not equipped. Just like in a family, some kids have to take on a parental role, and because they're out of their realm, yeah, they become very critical, and they're badgering you constantly, trying to get you to behave and look better and. And so they're the inner critics we all love to hate, but they're just little kids trying to keep you safe. Ah, oh, okay. And then there are other manager type parts, like caretaking parts that are trying to take care of everybody so they like you and don't let you take care of yourself. And, there's, you know, parts that keep you in your head and are very intellectual. And they're just trying to keep you away from these exiles. So there's a whole bunch of common manager roles. Yeah. But they're not the essence of the part. They're the roles they got forced into. And then, because the world has a way of breaking through those defenses and other systems and triggering your exiles, there has to be a group of parts whose job it is to immediately go into action to deal with this big emergency. The emergency being you might feel the pain of the exile. Yeah, the pain or the terror or the shame or whatever the feeling is that you might not only feel it, but be brought back into being that little kid. And so they tend to be impulsive, reactive, damn the torpedoes, I'm going to get you away from this right now, regardless of the collateral damage to your body, to your relationships. So we call them firefighters. They're, they're fighting the, fire, the flames of emotion coming from the exiles. Yeah. 
And in contrast to the managers who are trying to please everybody and, and keep you, you know, in, in line, they piss off everybody and they... <laughs> the firefighters, firefighters do? And they would be, like an example, could be like an, an addiction. Addiction, yeah. Or uh, rage is often a common firefighter or uh, dissociation sometimes, you know, whatever... We all have them. So, you know, you've got firefighter activities. So when you feel any of your exiles coming up, is there a first line firefighter activity you go to? I don't know. Yeah, it was interesting because I, I asked you before this interview if you um, could bring a case study to the table to help me kind of, uh, you know, understand that it's a, it's a fairly intricate system that you've set up. And you suggested that you and I talk, Yeah. which, of course, scared me. Yeah, of course. But I, I'd be open to it Fantastic. if you want to do that. Sure. Before we do, let me just add one more. This is like the big discovery in IFS. Um, I mean, some of that is important, but... In doing this work as a family therapist, I was trying to get clients to talk to their parts in a nice way. So they listen to that part and get to know it and help it change once I caught on to the fact they're not what they seem. So I'd be doing that, and let's say you're talking to your critic. Okay. And you're listening and asking questions like, why why did you do this? And what are you afraid would happen if you didn't? And you're getting decent answers. But all of a sudden, you get immediately f angry at the critic. And the critic's getting defensive now and, and getting more extreme and saying all the nasty things. And as a family therapist, I learned that when you're having two people in a family talk to each other and one gets extreme with the other suddenly, we would look around the room and see if somebody isn't covertly siding with that one against the other. And often you'd find that that was true. And then you'd ask that person to step back in the room out of their line of vision and the conversation would settle down and they do well. And I was thinking, maybe that's happening in this inner system. So while you're trying to get to know the critic, part that hates the critic has come in and done the talking. So I would ask clients, could you find that one and get it to step back a little bit in there? And to my amazement, they'd say, okay, it did. And they'd say, now how do you feel toward the critic? It would be entirely different. Wow. And they'd say, I'm just kind of curious about why it's calling me names. And, I, and they'd feel calm and confident relative to it. And it's like this new person came forward suddenly. And I would do that with other clients, and you just get certain parts to step back, and up would pop this, this person who just knew how to heal. They just knew how to be loving to these parts and listen to them and start to help them change. And I was amazed, uh, for reasons we don't have time to go into, but as I saw that happening in many different clients, at some point, I started asking, now, what part of you is this? And they would say, that's not a part like these others. That's myself, or that's my core self, or that's me. And I came to call that the self with a capital S. To differentiate it from? From the ordinary use of the word self for yeah. the whole person. And it turns out now, this is, uh, <laughs> that was almost four decades ago. And so thousands of clients later, thousands of therapists using this all over the world, we can safely say that that self is in everybody. Hmm. And it can't be damaged. And it knows how to heal. in your work about a trailhead, mm -hmm. taking taking note of an area that might be kind of juicy or mm -hmm. interesting to work with. And I know that um, for me, I got bullied when I was um, in eighth grade. Mm -hmm. And it was, I don't want to say like it was, a, a, like it was really bad, mm -hmm. but the way I experienced it was that it was, it was bad. bad. Yeah. yeah. I took it inside myself. It shut, it felt like it shut down. Mm -hmm. some pieces of me. And mm -hmm. so that reminded me of, mm -hmm. of your work here. And then, beautiful, yeah. So, uh, do you want to focus on the pain of that or the, the shame or do you want to focus on the part that shut them down, pushed it away? Or? Yeah. I'm kind of interested in, in that, that shutting down because yeah. I, and the way that it's affected my personality going forward, even to now. I've, right. I've done work with it here at Esalen in the past five years, which has been really cool and really interesting to be an adult in my 40s dealing with something that happened when I was 13. Right. Um, and yet I also s still feel there are parts of my personality that were dictated by that. Yeah. So let's, let's do that exploration. 
So go ahead and find that part of you that's shut you down uh, and see if you can find it in your body, around your body. What am I looking for, Dick? You know, a numbing part maybe or a part that takes you out somehow or that, or just uh, as you think about, here's the way to do it. If, as you think about going to that 13-year-old boy in there, what comes up in terms of fear? Uh, I, I don't feel fear. I feel like I can see that boy in kind of like a almost a pre-adolescent mm-hmm. state, kind of the like soft or weak. Okay. And I just feel like um, I don't feel that connected to him. Okay. Like that's, a, like a that's, distance. That's where we're headed. So, yeah. How do you feel toward him as you see him there? A little bit like I don't want to be with him. Yeah. So that's the part. So focus on that that feeling like you don't want to be with him. Mm-hmm. And ask that part what it's afraid would happen if it let you be with him. Um, it, it, it kind of look, to me. It's he, he's scared that he's going to get physically um, beat. So the boy is afraid of that. Yeah, almost like maybe afraid of me. Okay, but how are you feeling toward him? Mixed emotions, like yeah. partially, like I want him to toughen up and just be right. It's <laughs> just why are you in this in the first place? Why don't you just lash out? Right. So let's start there, mm-hmm. and we're going to ask that part. We understand why he would want that, but we're going to ask him to give us the space to try and help this boy a different way, and see if he'd be willing to step back or relax in there a little bit. Do I actually say something to him? You don't have to say it out loud, yeah. but inside. And just see if you can sense that part receding or relaxing. Yes, I sense, I sense that angry lashing out part is willing, right. willing to step back. So as it does, how do you feel toward the boy now? A, a bit closer, like, like my brother. Yeah, good. Okay, so let him know that you, you're there as a brother to him. And see how he reacts to that no, that news. Mm, yeah, he feels good. Yeah, yeah. almost like he's filled, more filled with life and he's kind of peppy and, and cool. That's great. Yeah. Okay, so ask him whatever he, what does he want you to know about himself? And just wait for the answer to come. I'm, I'm asking him what he wants to, wants me to know about him. Yeah. I'm getting that he wants to be on, like, wants to be on the baseball team. Yeah. Okay. So let him know you get that. Okay. And how close are you to him now inside? We're closer, but we're still, we're still apart. Okay. Because I, I just feel old and the, like, whoever is me on this side. Okay, so we're going to ask the one who feels old to step out, too? See if that's possible. Yeah. And now how do you feel toward him, and how close are you to him? Like friends, like, like you know, best friends. Perfect. And how's he reacting? Yeah, he's, he's opening up, and it's, it's kind of like we can... Like we could have a really fun time if he slipped over. Nice, nice. Good, and you're close to him now. Mm hmm. Okay, so he seems to trust that you care about him. Mm hmm. Okay, Sam, then go ahead and ask him to really let you get a sense of what happened to him to make him feel bullied and just wait for that to come to now. Whatever he wants to give you in the way of emotions, sensations, images. He's saying that he, he was, he's surprised, he was betrayed, he feels betrayed. Okay. So ask him about that. In what way was he betrayed? That he thought it was all cool between him and, and oh. the guy. And then, you know, like they were on, you know, on the same side. And then all of a sudden he's, you know, he's calling him up, and, you know, and saying he's going to beat the shit out of him. Okay. Does that make sense to you, Sam? Sure. Yeah, so let him know you get that. Yeah. And whatever else he wants to give you and what it was like for him. 
I'm having trouble separating out the because I've done so much thinking about it. I'm having trouble yeah. separating out what my assumptions are around it and my memories of it and the way he actually is feeling. Yeah, so we're going to ask the thinking part, the narrating part, to give us some space too, just like we did the others, and see if that's possible. See if that thinking part would step out too. Yes. Okay. All right. So then go ahead and ask him again to really let you know what happened and how bad it was. <laughs> Just the, the rejection. Yeah. And is it okay to feel all this? Tell him you're, you're ready to feel all this now. And just stay with the rejection feeling until he feels like you really get how bad it was. I, I feel like um, I was there and then I pulled back from it. Yeah, so f find the part that pulled, pulled you back. This other adult piece of me. Yeah. And ask it why. Ask it what it's afraid would happen if it had let you stay with the rejection feeling. I would feel too much. It would be embarrassing. Oh, embarrassing yeah. to, to listeners or embarrassing to me or you'd feel judged by me or... No, no not by you. By, okay. by me. All right. So there's some kind of... Maybe it was that original tough guy... Uh huh. Who would beat you up for having cried? It is. All right. So, you know, we don't have to keep going if it's if that's too scary. But we could maybe get that guy into a contained room for a while. Yeah. And make things a little safer. Okay. And just tell him. We'll talk to him afterwards. We'll let him out. He he gets that. Okay. So now see if the part who came in to pull you away can let us go back. Because I promise if they really let you go all the way with this, we can heal this guy. So he's no longer stuck back there. He no longer feels that bad. And then they won't have to worry about him. They just need to give us the space. Well, the tough guy says he's in the room. So he's, he's ready. He's, he's going to give us the space. Okay, that's great. All right, see if you can get back to the pain of the rejection. See if you can get back to that boy. And I'm, I'm listening to him? Yeah, you're back with him, and he's, he's sharing with you his feelings and how bad it was. See if you can get back there. Is there still something blocking, Sam? Yeah, I don't. I don't feel like we're. I'm with the the boy. Yeah. So there's some part that's in the way. So just ask whoever is blocking what they're afraid would happen now if they let you be with him. Not getting an answer. No, get more like a, yeah, like a, a empty space. All right. So let me talk to the part directly. Yes. Okay. So are you there? Are you willing to talk to me? Yes. Okay. So you're the part of Sam that's blocking him from being with the boy now. Is that right? Yes. And what are you afraid would happen if you let him go back to the boy and feel some of that? It's that, it's that connecting to that weak boy would be softening up the whole the whole person. And what would happen then if Sam was softer? I'd have to change the whole this whole person that, that I've spent so much time constructing. <laughs> okay. Well that's that's a point. So yeah. I, I run a I run a tight ship is what I'm trying to say. I Everything it. works I it. I the way it. I do it. Yeah, yeah, I get it. All right, well we don't wanna screw everything up for you. Um, now, on the other hand, I think some of the, the tightness of the ship, some of how hard you have to work, is probably because this boy is in there mm -hmm. and you're trying to keep Sam away from him. Mm. Is that true? Yeah. And what I'm offering is the possibility of 
not having to work so hard because the boy is going to be feeling good. Okay. Well, I'm, you know, I'm open to, I'm open to not working so hard because it's, it's, a, I do a lot, you know? I get that. I, I, you're sort of the big guy in there, it sounds like. Yeah. I mean, if, if I wasn't here, then how am I going <laughs> to yeah. help Sam achieve, do everything, I get all run, run everything? I get all that. So, I, you know, we won't do it without your permission, but if you're willing, I promise we can do what I just said. Yeah, well, I think it'll, it'll ultimately be better for Sam, so I'm into it. All right, that's great. So if you don't mind going into a waiting room or something in there just till we're done. Sure. How, you, you how, how long? Uh, this, if, if nobody else interferes, <laughs> we can probably do this in the next 15 minutes. Okay, let me, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in there. All right, good. All right, let me talk to Sam again. Okay. All right, see if you can get close to the boy now. Yes, I feel close to him. Good. So let him know you're back, and let him know you're sorry that these parts pulled you away. Did you let that happen? Yes. And tell him you're ready to know the rest of it, everything he wants you to get about how bad it was. Yeah. He feels really small. Yeah. Younger than 13. Okay. Way younger. Okay. Just stay with it. Yeah, like a little, like a two-year-old. Okay. How do you feel toward the two-year-old? Tender. Nice. So let that part know, too, that you're with them and you care about them. Yeah, it's, it's easier for me to feel close. Okay. Then just see what this one wants you to know. I'm feeling a lot of, a lot of love right now. I feel that my, my heart is opening. Nice. Yeah, and I can, yeah, I'm feeling love towards the, the 13 year old too. Perfect. Yes, like, like a tenderness, like a father. Perfect. So let them both know. It feels good. It feels really, really sweet. Yeah, we can just stay with this for a while if you want. But also be open if there's something they want you to know. I, f I feel the the thirteen year old me. I see him and he's dressed in sort of the awkward clothes, mm -hmm. of a seventh eighth grade boy, and mm -hmm. feeling a, a big deal to him was that he's he's not pu pubescent enough. He's not like the other. He hasn't you know, developed enough. Yeah. His clothes don't look right, and he's couldn't defend himself right, and it that like his bones feel brittle, and that that feels kind of like darn too bad. Yeah, I get that. I was the youngest in my class, just about. So stay with him with all that. Mm -hmm. But I don't feel disgusted by him. I feel no. I'm, I'm empathizing now. Let him know. I'm yeah. I'm feeling connected. Right. That's fantastic. See if there's more he wants you to get about all that. Just that he wants to be funny and and popular. Yeah. And that it, it hurt a lot. That it was a sort of a... It, it smacked that idea down to, to be bullied. Really shut him down. Yeah. yeah. And I'm thinking about how later when I, when I developed and when I was 19 and in college and I figured out a way to be cool, how, how important that was to me. Of course. After he went through that, of course. But stay with him. Yes. And just tell him you're getting all this and see if there's more he wants you to get. Yeah, it, it, it's... it's There's no mean-spiritedness to, to him. He, he doesn't feel this is... He's not, he's not angry. He's more just uh, hurt, but still kind of like optimistic. Mm -hmm. Good. Didn't kill that in him. No. That's great. But ask him if he does feel like you get how much it did hurt, or if there's more of that he wants you to get. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of accessing a, a more 
dark night of the soul type of feeling from him and the, and the scaredness. Yeah, let him know you, you're good with that. You, you really want to feel that mm. as much as he wants you to. Mm. I feel like I'm, I'm open to, to feeling it, but it doesn't feel like it needs to be re-experienced. Okay, it's whatever he wants. Uh, yeah, that's what that's what it feels like. He he doesn't need that. Okay, he's saying that. Just be sure it's coming from him. Mm, mm. I think he feels like I like I like I know, and I'm I know. Okay, but we really do need to get it directly from him because you said I think. Mm, mm. So thinking parts out again. Mm, okay. And just wait and ask him directly. He says, you know. Okay, good. So, Sam, I want you to go into that time period and be with him in the way he needed somebody. Mm. And just tell me when you're in there with him. I'm there. How are you being with him? As a friend and protector. Great. How's he reacting? He feels good. Good. Have somebody on his team. That's right. And ask him if there's anything he wants you to do for him back there or with him. He wants me to bring him into adulthood where he can have sex and yeah, <laughs> do not do grown-up things. He's always been interested in being in that realm. Okay, well, we're going to do that. But first, does he want you to do anything with the bully or anything else back there before we take him out? No, he doesn't. He doesn't seem he just ready vindictive. Yeah, he doesn't seem like he wants anybody okay. beat up. All right. All right, so let's... Take him wherever he wants to go. Mm -hmm. Could be the present, could be a fantasy place, could be another time in your life. Okay. Wherever he wants. Do you want me to say where it is? Yeah. Burning Man. Oh, great. Okay. How's he like it there? A little shy. Mm hmm. But you're there with him still? Mm hmm. Yeah. So let him know that you're going to help him learn the ropes there. Okay. Yes. And tell him he never has to go back there again. And yeah, there's all the relief, right? It's so great. It's great. Yeah. Never has to go back there. joy. That's great. Yeah, never has to go back. And you're going to be taking care of him now. So great. It's like what he's always wanted. There you go. And ask now if he's ready to unload the feelings and beliefs he got back there that he's been carrying all this time. Ask where he carries all that in his body or around his body. Around his body. Around his around his head. Yeah. Yeah. Around his head. Around his his hips and heart. Okay. And ask what he wants to give it all up to. Light, water, fire, wind, earth, or anything else. Light. All right, Sam. So bring the light in and have it shine on him. And tell him to let all that go out of his body, off his body. Just let the light take it away. No need to carry that anymore. Is it all gone? Just have him check his body and be sure he gets all of it out. Yeah, that too, all that stuff. Let it go into the light. That's right. And tell him now to invite qualities into his body that he wants and just see what comes into him now. Like a pride. Mm -hmm. and, and kindness to others. Great. 
just like a like a good superhero type of feel. Cool. So how does he seem now? Like my like my younger friend. Mm-hmm. Like, okay. Yeah. But but safe, you know, and strong. That's right. All right, so let's let all these guys out of the waiting room and the, hmm. you know, container. Yes. <laughs> and have them all come in and see him now and see how they react. Impressed? Mm-hmm. Tough guys, okay. Mm-hmm. So let them know. They don't have to protect him or they don't have to keep you away from him anymore so they can start thinking about new roles. <laughs> I mean, I see, like, curiosity, befuddlement on the tough guy's <laughs> face. And just still, he's he's totally confused that he's not me. No, he's not you. Make make that clear to him. And he's been he was beating up that kid, which wasn't good. So right, he needs to think about a new role now. What what can he do? What will he be? Ask him. What would he like to do if he really trusted? He didn't have to protect you like he used to. Well, he's saying he's so good at everything that he. Yeah. Can you just choose? Yeah, he can just pick whatever he wants. <laughs> he's really like really high on himself. <laughs> really. <laughs> everything yeah. He's he's everything that I've good that I've done in my life, he's taking he's credit, credit for. for yeah. yeah. My job my job. He can think about a new role. Doesn't have to decide right now. Okay. Now he's different from the the big boss we met at the at the end, right? The or is he the same? I think he's the same. Guy. Okay, all right. like like oh, the, I don't think he really went away in the beginning. Okay, okay, that's good to know. Are right, any other parts protectors reacting? What are some examples of of protectors? I'm trying to think of the ones we met on the way. Um, there were parts that didn't want you to feel sad. You know, it, it, it's okay. I mean, yeah, we don't have to check in with them really. Just how's it feeling in there now? It's it's feeling spacious. Good. Yeah, it's it's feeling interesting and different. Yeah. Okay. Does it feel complete for now? It does, and I'm interested about how I can get in touch with this tough guy to let him know that although he's not in control of the show, he's still important. Yeah. To me, what? How did? That's exactly what you got to tell him, and uh, he's right there. You don't have to work to get get in touch with him he's he's around all the time so you just uh, you know focus on him and talk to him about it so come on back it's a beautiful piece of work Sam thank you yeah thank you thank you I was not expecting that <laughs> was listening to with you where the the person was talking about parallels between IFS and shamanism Mm -hmm. and I felt like there was an energetic Mm -hmm. component to the work that you did would you mind speaking about that a bit yeah um you know as I started to play around in this inner world with these parts I had an associate uh, named Mitchie Rose back in the day who was into shamanism she said, you know, a lot of this sounds quite similar. So I got interested and I checked out, there's a woman named Sandra Ingerman and some other people had written about uh, soul retrieval and things like that and it sounded similar. So my belief is this is the same world that shamans enter, have been entering for centuries and know the territory also. Um, and when you talk about soul retrieval, they're actually talking about some retrieval, which yeah. we just did, yeah. of some part that's been locked up somewhere. Mm-hmm. So all that's very parallel. And one difference is, at least in terms of her work, the shamans tend to rely on uh, spirit guides or you know, to do the retrieving, to do the work in the inner world. And in this work, we prefer to have the self of the person do that because one of the big goals of IFS is what I call the restoration of trust of the parts in self as a leader. Mm. 
And if you've got your spirit guides doing it, then that doesn't really I see. happen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I found interesting about the work that you did was this, um, the speaking to different parts of myself in, in a certain sense, you know, the dominant psychological ideology at Esalen has been gestalt, mm-hmm. which includes this concept of the, the open seat mm-hmm. and a bit of psychodrama mm-hmm. where one is speaking to mm-hmm. either different selves yeah. or, uh, or different people. Yep. So is there a connection between IFS and gestalt? I think so. You know, um, way back in the day, when I was hearing from clients about all these parts, I had heard about the, the open chair technique. And so I started to do it that way. And I would have clients sit in one chair talking to some part in, in the other chair. Like if we were to do it, I would have you talk to the tough guy who'd be in the other chair. And then I'd have you be him and talk to you in the open chair. And because I was hearing about five and six parts and I'm a systems thinker and I'm you know tracking patterns and stuff, I'd have people hopping all over my office being these different parts. And there was one client early on who said, you know, I don't really have to use these chairs. I can just sit here and do it. Mm -hmm. So from that point on, basically people just sit here and do it. But the idea of parts uh, is comparable. You know, I think, I don't know for sure, but I think Pearl's got it from a guy named Asagioli who developed something called psychosynthesis who influenced a lot of people, Virginia Satir and other people. There's also somebody named um, Moreno, Jacob Moreno. Jacob Moreno uh, developed uh, psychodrama. Mm. And so Pearls took that chair technique from Moreno. But the idea of parts has been floating around for a long time. As we're talking about, I think I brought family systems thinking to it. Uh Now, is, is systems thinking part of family therapy? Yeah. Yeah, so my history is I worked on a psych unit, and I saw that's all crazy what they're doing there, and there's got to be a better way. What was the psych unit characterized by? You know, it was a psychodynamic, psychoanalytic unit back in the day. I was in college, so I was quite young. During the 70s? Yeah. It was the adolescent unit. I got close to some of these kids. I was not that much older, and they would tell me about their sessions, which some of the sessions they they wouldn't talk, the therapists wouldn't talk. But some of them were mainly about, you know, their inner stuff or, you know, and on the weekends, the families would come to visit and be tearing into these kids, but it would never come up in their sessions. And I had one kid kill herself right after one of those weekend visits. And I thought, this is really screwed up. There's got to be a better way. And then I started hearing about systems thinking, Gregory Bateson, who spent time here and other people like that. And uh, I've never understood what systems thinking is. That's what it is. Rather than taking one individual and thinking about changing that person, Mm -hmm. family systems thinking said, this person is acting out because there's this whole other network of relationships. So rather than thinking just about an individual, you're thinking about all the context was Bateson's big idea. Thank you. You can't take a person out of their context and understand what's going on with them. So I just took that to the inner world. So... You can't take one part at a time because it's polarized with this one and it's protecting this other one and it's stuck in the past. And so I could see all of that in a way that other people hadn't thought of because they didn't think about systems. When you first developed your model, was it where you thought of as kind of like out there guy? Very much, yeah. And I developed it in a department of psychiatry at the University of Illinois in Chicago and it was very psychodynamic Department, particularly uh, this guy Heinz Kohut was their big hero. He instilled in his therapists this tremendous fear of fragmenting people. And so... Can you, can you talk about what that is? You know, it's a fear that if you spend too much time in these ex- with these extreme feelings, that people are going to fall apart. And so I got up in front of a... Uh, as a like a 32-year-old kid... Uh, in front of a sea of white, you know, medical jackets, whatever they call them, and at Grand Rounds and presented on this model and uh, just got skewered. You know, they, they you're, you're fragmenting people, you're dangerous. One guy tried to get me fired. Yeah. So, yeah, it was, it's was it been a tough sell. There are a lot of scars along the way. But then the world of psychology has somewhat moved to the left over the past 30, 40 years 
I don't know about psychology. I mean, I think psychotherapy has. Okay. Yeah, psychology is still pretty hardcore CBT and stuff like that. Uh -huh. But there's much more emphasis now on healing and on trauma as the core, as what's causing these diagnostic categories in people. And that's just a huge you know, paradigm shift away from uh, what it had been, and it's really, really great. Now, just to clarify, is trauma central to your paradigm as well? Yeah. Because in the, in the beginning of the, the talk, I think you had said that the, some other, I think it was multiple personality disorder, yeah. was based around great trauma. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. I mean, I've worked with those clients, and yeah, their trauma is really horrible and daily for years usually. But, uh, you know, what we just did was a piece of trauma work. Yes. So, you know, most most of these what I call exiled parts are stuck in some traumatic scene that we have to get them out of. Mm. So. There's a concept in your in your work that I wanted to just have you touch on for it's this concept of blending. Mm -hmm. Can you describe what that is and why it's important? Yeah. So when we went to work with that 13 year old boy, um, I asked you how you felt toward him. And at first, you didn't want to go get close to him and remember that. And then the tough guy came in and wanted to toughen him up. And remember all that? Yeah. So those parts at that point were blended with yourself. So yourself is always in there. Okay. But it's blended with these parts such that they are giving you all of their perspective. And, and this guy even thought he was you, remember? Um, so they're coloring the way you see the part, the world, they're organizing your life. As they separate, as you found, as they unblend, immediately you had compassion for the boy. And as we unblended more, more compassion. You spontaneously wanted to be with him and be his friend. And so that's what I find over and over. That self is in there, knows how to do this healing thing. Mm but is blended with these protectors. So a lot of the work is just getting those protectors to trust it's safe to let us let you be in self relative to the boy. And I'm a hope merchant. I sell hope to them. I say, I get it, and we won't do it without your permission, which I did say to your protector. Yeah. But if you give us permission, I can free you up to relax. You don't have to work so hard. And I've got a really nice sales pitch. Yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> and then they step out, and then we go to the exile. And what exiles need, like in your case, they need you to finally get what happened and how bad it was. The betrayal, the, you know, the feeling behind and immaturity, all of that. All the stuff you got was what he really needed. He's been sitting in there waiting for you to come in and get this. So you get it. And then we take him out to a good place, and then we unburden. We, we release all these extreme beliefs and emotions he picked up. And now he's feeling great. So, And then we bring in the protectors to see they don't have to do this anymore. So, Yeah, I'm still kind of in, in shock a little yeah, bit around yeah. it. And it'll take me, I don't know, is there a protocol for the, the way to bring it into your life? Very much, yeah. So... Listen to this podcast. I mean, you can edit it, I guess. I'll edit it. Yeah. So, and then every day, probably for a month or so, as a meditation, check on that boy, check on the two-year-old, mm -hmm. remind the tough guy he doesn't have to do that anymore. Uh -huh. And if you do all of that, it will stick. With, 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 I think there's a lot of insight that I can gain from it and sort of like looking. I had no idea how much I was controlled and, and so into that rigidity mm -hmm. and criticalness mm -hmm. yeah. and this kind of like ideas out, out around being stronger or better than mm -hmm. people, yeah. but that, that it's all tied to that protector. Self. Exactly. That's right. Exactly. To the protector. And he's doing that because that boy was still stuck back there. Because it would be, he's doing that because it was so painful for, for me right. to feel the the shame around being weak about around being weak exactly mm. and he swore I'll never let you be weak again yeah right? but you got to play by my rules got, I'm taking over here yeah that's what I mean by a parentified <laughs> child you know he says screw you screw Sam I'm not gonna let him lead anymore I'm taking over oh, that's so great <laughs> well Dick I want to I want to get you out of here I just want to ask you one more question the um 
The reason for being for Esalen has been human potential. And I wonder if you could just talk about Esalen and its sensibility in regards to how, how that works with your work. Yeah, so um, I think I've been coming here 22 straight years, I think. And I love it here, uh, partly because the energy here is so healing. I've actually worked in the Murphy room, the Murphy house, that whole time. And I... You know, already where it's our second day and people are doing the kind of work you just did. And uh, and so Esalen has nurtured this, uh, you know, it was the, sort of the home of a lot of the humanistic psychology movement, which I feel very connected to. Sort of in, I'm standing on some of those shoulders yes. of those giants. And so it, it's an honor to work here. Yeah, some of it's the tradition, and and I do believe that uh, I'm contributing to this human potential thing. I think I actually IFS has exploded the last five years. I'm totally overwhelmed uh, by invitations and so on, but it can get much bigger. And what are what are your hopes for that? I'm really hoping that it can come to replace the basic paradigm of the mind in our culture, not just our culture, but to replace all the stuff that uh, we waited through <laughs> yeah. to get there and to, for people to know this is who we really are, this self, and to know how to be in self with each other. And, to, and when you're in self this way, you have a desire to connect to the self of another person. You have the desire, you feel connected to the big self, whatever you want to call that. You feel connected to the earth in a different way. And you feel connected to your parts and the desire to connect to your parts. So it's, it's a kind of connect the dots approach that uh, makes... But to do that, you've got to unburden. You've got to release all these extreme beliefs and emotions and help your parts trust you to, that it's safe for you to lead rather than the tough guy. Well, Dick Schwartz, thank you so much. How, how much do I owe you? <laughs> this one's on me, Sam. You, you did me a big favor. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Voices of Esalen. Today's show is produced in conjunction with Cheryl Franzel, Terry Gilby, Shannon Hudson, and Greg Archer. Our theme music is by Nico Holloman. You can find all of our podcasts on your favorite podcast player, as well as at esalen.org. The Esalen Institute is a nonprofit organization. Our show is made possible by your contributions. Your contributions.